Good morning. It's good to uh, see you here in the building today. Welcome today as well, as well uh, watching uh, at home. Uh, my name is Russell Nell. For those of you who don't know, I'm part of the leadership team here at Long Meadow. Um, we've been thinking over these past uh, couple of weeks about how we deal with the realities of, of a broken world, where sickness and suffering persist, where stress is real and brings struggle and hardship. And in those kind of circumstances, uh, the lights and decorations and preparations for Christmas can seem out of place or jarring even. But Christmas is the greatest of good news and worth celebrating even in the midst of a broken world because it is the dawning of Emmanuel. Matthew uh, 1 says this, this is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Emmanuel, that's the good news of Christmas. God with us, God come close. God who gets involved, God who presences himself amongst his people. God in the midst of the dirt and the, and the grime, literally, as he was born, in a, as he lies in an animal feeding trough. God who is here. And we remember that as we light our Advent uh, can candle this morning, that God is the God who is with us, Emmanuel, the light of the world, come to bring hope to all of us. And we're going to reflect on that wonderful name this morning as we sing together. And that promise of Emmanuel goes far beyond just a manger in Bethlehem. As our first song reminds us, it takes us to the whole story of the life, death, resurrection and return of Jesus. So if you're able, you stand and let us sing together. From the smaller of the borrowed table by the spirit and the blood you say to the anguish and the shame of scandal came the savior of the human race. Oh, 
Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the gift of your Son to us. We thank you that the Lord Jesus is God come close to us. Emmanuel, God who is with us in all things. Thank you that he has walked the paths that we walk. Thank you that he has been through the greatest path of all, through death and onto life. And he will take us with, us, with him. Thank you too that he is with us now by your Spirit. And we pray that we would know that presence this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen. It was the coming of Emmanuel that those angels first announced to the shepherds on the hillside outside Bethlehem. So we're going to sing a carol all about that. that we sing each and every year and we love to sing them it can be easy to miss their impact can't it we were listening to some carols at home the other day and i was struck again by the wonder of what we have here the incarnate deity god himself become man to rescue us and to bring us forgiveness our emmanuel the one who brings light and life in the midst of our darkness risen with healing in his wings born that we may no longer die but might live forever to enjoy him. That's what the, the angels announced at Christmas time. God had come to earth to rescue and to forgive each and every one of us as we come to, uh, come to him. And that's, work, work, uh, that's news that our suffering world desperately needs to hear, isn't it? And our next carol remembers that. It reminds us of the, the challenge that comes of a response to Jesus, but the comfort that also comes with this newborn king. And it looks forward to his one day return. Let's sing it. <laughs>
please take a seat. In the light of what we've just been singing about, we're going to take a few moments now to pray for our world at large, a world which is full of sorrow brought by sin and strife. And we're going to pray to you for those who we know whose journey is hard, who are treading the rocky path of life with painful steps. We're going to pray that Emmanuel, God with us, would make himself known in each of those situations, that he would bring comfort to those who trust him and forgiveness to those who do not yet know him. And we're going to do that uh, in smaller groups uh, here in the building, and you can do that at home as well. Um, So just turn to a few folk uh, around you and pray for our world. Pray for those that you know are struggling and ask that Emmanuel would reveal himself and bring comfort and hope. If you're not comfortable doing that, that's fine. Just bow your head and people will know to leave you alone. But it'd be great to pray together for our world and for those that we know are struggling and suffering. Let's pray for a few moments together. Lord God, we are so grateful that you are not one who stands far off and distant, but you are one who has come and got involved in our world, even to the extent, Lord Jesus, of suffering in our place. We thank you that you are Emmanuel, God with us. And so we pray that you would increasingly make yourself known in this world that you have come to rescue. We pray you would do so uh, in places where there is strife and war at the moment. We ask too that you would do it in places where there is peace and contentment at the moment. 
We long that men and women, boys and girls right across the world might turn and know the wonder of the light of the world who has come to rescue us and who is with us now. And so please, Lord, would you be at work by your spirit? And would you be at work too in and through us that we might share this great good news of Christmas at this uh, festive time? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let me tell you about a few things coming up uh, this next week or so, or even this afternoon. This afternoon is our Christmas uh, fa uh, family party uh, between two and four this afternoon. Uh, thank you for all those uh, who brought chocolate coins and things. Uh, that's great. Uh, if there are any who are coming this afternoon who could bring any cakes along, uh, that would be good. Um, and uh, anyone else who would still like to be involved in helping, I think we're, we have enough people, but a few more is always uh, helpful. And particularly uh, with the clear up, at four o'clock, even if you're able to pop along just for half an hour there, um, that, would be, that would be great. Uh, our next community lunch is this coming Tuesday at 12 noon. Uh, if you are coming, there's a sign-up sheet out in the foyer. If you could scribble your name down on that, even if you've already told Gemma, uh, scribble your name down on that, that would be really helpful just so we can uh, clarify that. Uh, that would be great. And if you are able to come, do come. If you're not able to come, do pray. It's a great opportunity as we seek to build those relationships with those in our community around us. Our Christmas services are also coming up because it's Christmas time. That makes sense, doesn't it? Um, you can see when uh, they're coming. Those flyers are now available in the foyer if you want to take some away for friends and family. There are also some packs there that to be delivered just to the area around us here, uh, divided up with a nice little map so you can see where you're going. If you are able to do that, uh, do on the way out, pick up one of those packs. Um, uh, if we all took one, they'd all be gone with uh, some left over. So uh, uh, do take those and uh, post those through some letterboxes. Uh, and the other thing to mention is um, the Sunday that lies between Christmas and New Year, the 31st New Year's Eve, uh, will be an all-age service. We'll be thinking about Thanksgiving for the year. And I mentioned on uh, Tuesday at the church uh, meeting uh, that it'd be great for people to have some stories to share uh, of what God's been doing uh, in them, what he's been teaching them over this past year. And remember, as we've been encouraged over these past couple of weeks, it's not just the good news stories that encourage us, is it? It's the stories of people keeping going through difficulty. And so often we think a testimony has to be something that's been resolved and sorted out. That's simply not the case. Uh, Emmanuel, God who is with us, is with us in the difficulty, as well as uh, sometimes bringing resolution. So if you have a story to tell, uh, do come and talk to me. Uh, you can either share it in person, or you could write it down and it can be read out. Um, but it'd be great to have some stories to share to encourage one another uh, as we do that. Let's pray for some of those things. Father, we've already th uh, thanked you for the good news of Christmas and we thank you for the opportunities that we have to share that good news this Christmas time. We pray for the, for the fun day this afternoon, for the community lunch uh, on Tuesday. Lord, we ask that there'll be conversations going on there where we have opportunities to share about why it is that we celebrate uh, this wonderful time of year. We pray too, Lord, that as we deliver the leaflets and as we give them to friends and neighbours, that people might take them and come along. We ask that there'll be many guests at our family carols and traditional carols and the Christmas Day morning itself. And we pray there'll be open hearts to listen to the good news of why we celebrate. And Lord, thank you too for the way in which you have been, Emmanuel, with us throughout this past year. Thank you for the things we can look back on with great joy. Thank you that you've been with us too in the times of great pain and difficulty. And so we ask that that service as we gather on the 31st might be an opportunity for us to encourage one another as we point towards the wonder of what it is to have Emmanuel, God with us in all things. In Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing again now of the wonder that is the coming to this world of Emmanuel. And we remind ourselves that one day he's coming back as well. If you're able, please stand and let's sing together.
We're going to continue to sing as we fill in the blanks between the first and the second coming of Jesus. The whole wonderful story of God's plan of salvation as we look from the manger to the cross, to the, from the cross to the empty tomb, from the empty tomb to the return of Emmanuel. Let's sing together. <laughs> Show us more of the great hope that we have in the Lord Jesus because he has come and lived and died, arisen again, and one day he's coming back. From the youngest to the oldest, we pray you would show us more of him and of the hope and security that we find in him. In Jesus' name. Amen. So you please take a seat. It's time now for the children to head out to their groups uh, through the back door. And it, why don't, uh, if you're waiting in here, why don't you take the opportunity to say hello to someone you haven't spoken to yet this morning. So we're continuing our, or whether we're finishing today, our short series looking at some of the big issues that we face uh, in life. Um, so this past year, I turned 50. I know, I know, surely not. How can that be? You don't believe me. How do I keep my skin looking so fresh? We, we can, we, it's not that funny. We can talk about that some other time. But that means, of course, that with hitting that age and with children leaving home, 
I am now that I'm now I'm either now or at some point in the very near future going to be experiencing a midlife crisis and we'll be knocking on the door of the local uh, sports car salesman to find out how much one of these things costs. Uh, it's an easy thing to, uh, to have a joke about, but it actually it can be a very serious matter. Reaching the point where there is less time on earth in front of you than there was behind you. And wondering what you've made of life so far. And then what you should be doing with the time that is yet to come. But actually, I don't think those big questions are confined to a midlife crisis at all. It's just that perhaps at that time of life, there's a bit more time and headspace for the questions to come to the surface. But wherever we are in time, uh, in life, time stretches out before us. Whether it be uh, in the expectation of decades that are still to come or simply years. The question is still there, what are you going to do with it? It's not simply the middle-aged who face the question of what's the point of life? What should I do with myself and my time? What am I trying to achieve? We're thinking uh, this morning about the issue of feeling directionless. And, uh, and it can take many different forms. But it's that question of, of purpose and of, of meaning, of value and significance in who you are and what, we, what you do. What should I do with my life? And does any of it matter? I suspect there are a few of us who don't wrestle with those questions, at least from time to time. When on the moments when work feels like you're simply marking time in order to, to pay the bills. Or when the monotony of daily life takes its toll and there's endless nappies or, or, or school runs or washing load after washing load, dinner after dinner. Well then later when the body begins to slow down and you're no longer able to do all that you once could. What does that mean for who I am? What does it mean for what I'm worth? What is my life all about? The search for direction in life essentially boils down, I think, to, to two key issues that we're going to be thinking about this morning. The first is the issue of purpose. What am I trying to achieve in life? And that's closely linked to the, the second one, which is the issue of significance. What makes things matter? How can my life not be a waste of time? So we could describe them as, as the what and the why of life. What am I trying to do and why should I bother doing it at all? Unless we think we should be embarrassed about even having those questions, well, the book of Ecclesiastes gives full voice to them. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. What do people gain from all their labours at which they toil under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun sets and it hurries back to where it rises. The wind blows to the south and turns to the north, round and round it goes, ever returning on its course. All streams flow into the sea, yet the sea is never full. To the place the streams come from, there they return again. All things are wearisome, more than one can say. The eye never has enough of seeing, nor the ear its fill of hearing. What has, been, what has been will be again, what has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. I think we might describe the writer to the Ecclesiastes as experiencing a sense of feeling directionless, mightn't we? And it's not simply a case of what should I do with my life, but why should I bother doing anything? What's the point? Ecclesiastes is a wonderful book to sit down and read, if a little unsettling when you first read it. It is the very definition of not giving pat, simplistic answers to life's tough questions. Most notably, that que those questions of meaning and significance in life. Instead, it gives full voice, as we've just heard, to the, to the frustrations that we can so often feel as, as human beings. What's the point of it all? But if on first reading, Ecclesiastes raises more questions than answers, look a little bit harder and you do see a little bit more. See, amidst that the writer's complaints about the meaninglessness of life, which Garrett go on through the book, but particularly in those opening, uh, those opening uh, verses, there's a re recurring phrase that echoes again and again as we go through. We heard it right at the end of that reading. Everything under the sun 
is what comes back again and again. In other words, if our reference point is only the physical and material world that we see around us, then it is difficult to escape the idea that nothing really matters. Because after all, apart from having babies to continue the, the, the ensure the continuation of the human race, what significance can the daily actions of your life or mine really have? But that idea is understandably far too depressing for anyone to seriously contemplate and to live like that's what life's really like. And it does, just doesn't fit with what we believe and know about ourselves and about those around us. We want to matter. And we want those around us to matter, so people look to find purpose and significance elsewhere. And so often today, I think we particularly hear the mantra of self-fulfillment. So the goal is to find what brings you a sense of satisfaction and completeness, which enables you to be all that you can be, to fulfill your, your potential and to reach a sense of contentment in yourself. Now, at first hearing, that all sounds very attractive and reasonable, doesn't it? Liberating, in fact, is a chance for direction in life. But a little digging beneath the surface reveals some terrible flaws in that way of thinking. Firstly, it's alarmingly self-centered, isn't it? What if something or someone gets in the way of your sense of self-fulfillment or your idea of happiness? Well, you just have to ride roughshod over them, don't you? And fundamentally, actually, it doesn't deal with those struggles that we mentioned earlier on. What about the mundane realities of life that fill so much of our time? Nappies and school runs and cooking and day-to-day -day chores. Who craves doing those things? They just get in the way then, don't they? Much like work does because work disturbs your sleep with an alarm to wake you up in the morning, and it gives you people to interact with who are not always very easy, and probably a degree of boredom in some of the tasks that you have to do day by day. And then when age comes along and begins to take effect, it just brings restrictions as the body isn't what it once was, it's just holding you back. How do you fulfil all that you are then? So much of life actually ends up being an obstacle to pursuing that goal of self-fulfillment, doesn't it? And so you end up feeling resentful of life and resentful perhaps too of others as well. There's no purpose in any of those things. You just have to get them out of the way until, of course, the time comes when you, when you can't. Oh, but there is, of course, an alternative to that self-fulfillment idea that puts my pleasure at the centre of life. Instead, I give my life meaning and purpose. I give my life direction in what I do for others. So I prove my usefulness and my value. Essentially, I justify my existence in my service of those around. So my work enables me to provide for my family. And those endless washing loads put clean clothes on my kids. And my grandparent duties free up my children to work. Now, none of those things are bad things to do or bad reasons to do them. But if, as is so often the case, they stem from a desire to, to give ourselves meaning, to justify ourselves, to give ourselves and our actions value, then they run into some major problems not very far down the line. First of all, they leave us constantly chasing our tails, don't they? We're constantly thinking we need to do one more thing to justify ourselves. We're constantly looking over our shoulder because our primary concern actually is what other people think of us. Are we useful enough to them? And that results in either exhaustion or resentment or both. And that takes us back to the problems we were thinking about last week as we consider the topic of stress. And secondly, it still fails to deal with the problem of a reduced capacity, which comes to all of us at some point. What happens when we cannot do all that we once could to help other people out? Whether that be because of physical struggles or mental health difficulties, or simply too many plates that we think we need to keep on spinning all the time. When we can't do those things, do we cease to have any value? Do we cease to have any direction in life? Does it all just become pointless? Do we become pointless? 
Well, the Bible has good news for us in all of this. The Bible has good news for us in all this. And the key is that there is more than what we see under the sun. That meaning and purpose and value and significance are found in God and not in ourselves and in knowing and being known by him. Not, and this is important, not in service of him. That would be to substitute God for others as we look over our shoulders and try and justify ourselves. I must do more for God and then I'm all right. No, it's in knowing and being known by him. It's in, the, it's in the reality of relationship, not activity. So with God in mind, the recognition that there is more than what we see under the sun, we're going to think about those two issues of, of purpose and of significance, or what we do, what am I trying to achieve, and why we do it, what makes something matter. So we're going to begin with purpose, the what question. Colossians 3, verses 15 to 17 says this. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. You remember that, that last week at the beginning of the sermon, Ben pointed us to the end of Colossians chapter 3, where this, uh, these verses come from, and the instruction there to slaves to work as if working for the Lord. And he helped us to see that, that our work is, is to nurture and develop the world and to help others to flourish, that all of it matters. So that work is not an, an unspiritual chore that we have to get out of the way, it has significance because it's an opportunity to partner with God in what he is doing. Well, we see that same principle at the end of those verses we've just read, that is applied there to the whole of life. That all we, uh, we, or whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. But, but notice too the, the context of the verses that precede it. That idea at the beginning in verse 15 of, of rest. The peace of Christ, not frantic, self-justifying activity. Not the, the aim is, of what you do is not to prove yourself worthy, to prove that you have value to the world around, or even to God. It all flows out of the peace that Christ brings. But as we, as we think about that question of purpose, of, of what we are to do, those questions are the ones that we often agonise over, aren't they? Should I, should I make this decision or that one? Should I follow this career path or that? Should I live here or should I live there? What should I do with my time? Can you see that in so many words, in so many ways, that's the, the wrong question to be asking? Paul says here, whatever you do, whether in word or do, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to God the Father through him. See, the key question is not the what, it's the why. The goal, the direction of life, is not driven by any idea of self-fulfillment or self-justification, but it is to do all things in his name, and so for his glory. And so suddenly, everything matters. Everything we do, from the mundane to the seemingly important, matters. What we do brings glory to God as we reflect his image to the world around, not by what it achieves. So the changing of a nappy reflects the servant-heartedness of God, and the painting of a picture reflects the creativity of God, and the service of a customer reflects the kindness of God. And the resting on our bed or on our couch reflects the fact that we are not God. But we are thankful that he is. And we are thankful for the security that we have in him and for the rest we are able to enjoy in him. So direction in life is not bound up by what we must achieve. The key question is not what should I do? Everything is for the glory of God. Which leads us to that second issue, the one of significance. So what makes something matter? Well, come with me to some, what I suspect are familiar words to many of us. 
in Ephesians chapter 2. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the rule of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the crazy wings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature are deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you've been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you've been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Well, I wonder if in the context of today's subject, your eyes are drawn instinctively towards the end of that passage and the good works that God has prepared in advance for us to do. That would seem to be a good place for us to start, wouldn't it, as we think about direction in life? We're back to that question again, aren't we? Well, so then what does God want us to do? Well, we'll get to those verses in a minute, but hold your horses for a minute. We need to read those verses in the context of what comes before. And here's why that's important. Because I think the question of what makes something I do matter, what gives it significance, is really the question, what makes me matter? What gives me significance? What will stop my life being a waste of time? That's what we're really asking. We see that in the, 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 uh, the thought that may come to mind with, all I do is, is, is change nappies and wash clothes when other people are performing heart surgery. What's the point in what I do? Which of those things is more, which of those people is more significant? What gives them value? But Ephesians 2 here, and Ephesians 1 actually, if you were to go back and read that, set a key baseline for how we understand all of this, that we are given significance and value by what God has done for us, it is given, it is not earned. In fact, actually, it could not be earned. We are recipients of God's grace and kindness. The impact of our lives, what we do, and the seemingly lesser or greater importance of those things is actually entirely irrelevant. It does not define who we are. It does not determine our identity. So whether I do more or whether I do less, whether what I, appear to, what I do appears to have national significance or if it appears to be mundane and irrelevant, it makes no difference. My value and my significance are bound up in Christ, not in what I do. So we don't look for direction in life. We don't make decisions on career paths to follow or, or places to live or activities to be involved in in order to justify our existence, to earn approval. Because as we trust in Christ, we are in him. But it's from that baseline then that Paul tells his readers, we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So therefore, each of us have purposeful, meaningful activity to be involved in. So the wonder of salvation by grace is not an excuse to sit back and do nothing. We are created to do good works. It's part of the purpose that we now have, to live like Christ, to be like him, to do good to others. As forgiven people, we are given significant things to do, and they are significant because they are God-prepared works. Now, that does not mean they will necessarily look significant to the world outside. They may not feel significant to us. And they will not always be pleasant things to do. They will not necessarily get us noticed. And they will not necessarily bring us applause. But then the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And we follow in his footsteps. So immediately, do you see, we have a, a contrast to those ideas of, of self-fulfillment 
or self-justification that we thought about earlier on. This is selfless living. It's not about self-centered concerns. It's about actively looking to do good for others. So we live and we act and we work and we do to the glory of God and in his service. Oh, but at this point, someone still wants to uh, ask the question, but how do I know what those good works are that God has prepared for me to do? And with that often comes the unspoken question that lies behind it. What if I miss them? What if I miss them? What if I get it wrong and do the wrong thing? Now, we don't have time to unpack the whole subject of guidance and decision making this morning, but here's one thing to get clear. Don't think too much of yourself. Don't think too much of yourself. Sometimes we think about guidance as if we were bomb disposal experts, that we're confronted with a choice, cut the blue wire or cut the red wire. Cut the right one and everything will be okay. Cut the wrong one and the entire thing will blow up, not simply in your face, but probably the face of everybody else and God's face too. And God will be left wringing his hands and wondering how on earth he can retrieve this situation that you've so awfully messed up by making the wrong choice. You're not that key to the universe, actually. You're not that key to the universe. You can't make the wrong decision and ruin God's plan. You can make wise decisions and you can make unwise decisions and both of those two things will bring consequences. But you can't ruin everything. And neither can you change your standing before him. So get a bit of perspective on the influence that you have on this world and on the influence that you have on your standing before God. It is all what he does and what he has done. But still, perhaps you're wanting to know, what are these good works that God has prepared for me to do? How will I know when I see them? Well, the problem with that question is that it makes a number of assumptions. Firstly, it assumes, it often means that we're thinking about particular things of great insignificance that we must not miss out on. But again, that vastly overestimates our own, our own importance. But secondly, uh, it often it fails to recognize that good works are shown in the mundane. They're shown in the everyday. The simple helping hand to help clear up or to provide something for someone. The listening ear. The way you remind someone of truth. The act of service. The hard work of praying for somebody. It's not the big, glamorous, eye-catching performances of good deeds that God is looking for. It's the steady day by day being like Jesus in whatever you do. The Bible is far more concerned, not with so much with the particulars of what you do in terms of your activity or your work and so on, as to the how and the why that you do it. An issue of character and of godliness. So what tasks lie ahead of you today, tomorrow when Monday morning comes? What people will come across your path? And so what are the opportunities for Christ-like good deeds that will come? Are you actively looking for those opportunities? Those are the things that God has prepared in advance for you to do, because those are the situations that he has placed you in. And he has placed you in those situations and no one else. Every day there are countless opportunities to do good works and so to bring glory to him. That's a direction in life to follow, isn't it? That's a direction in life to follow, and that's a great privilege and a great purpose. Let's pray together. Our Father God, we thank you that our standing before you does not depend on what we do, either the good things or the things that we mess up. We thank you that because of what the Lord Jesus has done for us on the cross, because we are now in him, we are secure and safe with you for all time and all eternity. Help us to rest secure in the realities of that. But we thank you too for the opportunities that you give us to do things that are significant as we do good works for those around. Thank you that they're given significance because of the way in which they reflect your character, which has been so kind and generous towards us. 
So please, Lord, we ask, keep our eyes looking outwards to see the opportunities that come, to listen well to others, to speak truth to them, to help out, to do menial tasks for others without complaining and without seeking for recompense or reward. Help us to be like the Lord Jesus, to serve those around us, to do good. And we thank you that you place us in situations where you've prepared good works for us to do. Help us, we pray, to see those things, to look away from ourselves and towards the good of others, that we might bring glory to the Lord Jesus who has rescued us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, as with the last uh, two weeks, as we've covered some of these issues, we're going to have the opportunity to uh, interview someone now. And Wayne's going to uh, come along. And I've got a few questions to ask Wayne. <laughs> he is coming. He's not bottled it at the last minute. That's a good sign. So, Wayne, tell us, um, uh, are there times when you felt directionless in, in life? Um, not often, but there's probably one main one that I can think of. So when I finished university, um, I was fairly set on the idea of being a teacher at that point. So I'd done some kind of volunteering in a school during my kind of last year of uni. Uh, and so when I finished, I went off and did a PGCE for a year. I started a job at a secondary school. Um, and then during the course of that year, it became blatantly apparent that I was not in the right place to be able to do that. And so thinking back to the uh, talk we'd had on stress, all of those kind of overstress markers, quite a lot of those were propping up. And actually, I had to end up dropping out during the course of my first teacher's year. Um, and so then I was, yeah, so two years ish after leaving uni, I trained to be a teacher. I'd now left that. And there was the question of actually having been out of software for two years, could I, could I get back in? Um, and so, yeah, uh, there was big questions of where, where I would go now and what I would do. Um, and what was that experience like? Um, so, I, uh, yeah, there, there was a certain amount of uncertainty. I don't know if I was too worried, or the idea that I, I would like never find valuable work again, I don't think was too much. I think I'd had enough teaching to know that it wasn't going to be a huge thing. Um, but certainly I, I had no idea what was going to go, what was going to happen next. No, no obvious direction of, of what was going to happen. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, you have a number of roles that you're currently uh, living out. You're a husband, you're a father, you're a software uh, engineer, you're a mm. church elder. Um, how do you find value and significance uh, in each of those things? So I suppose a bunch of them is uh, there's kind of a bit more obvious. I think kind of husband, father, church elder, I think we kind of more understand how those things are valuable. Um, being a software engineer, um, I mean, I write software for the logistics industry. And so if my role did not exist, if that, no one would notice. Uh, <laughs> it, on, on a worldwide scale, li, in, in, there's a real sense in which my job doesn't have any world significance at all. So I'm not like a teacher now or a nurse or a doctor or any of those things that we know have value. Um, so there's, there's a very real sense that the job that I'm doing doesn't, doesn't have value and doesn't matter in, in that kind of how we normally kind of rank things. Um, but actually, uh, I think, yeah, in, in the course of my work, I get, to, um, I get to strive to work well and to work diligently and to help other folk who are around me. Um, and I get to use my creativity in my work. Uh, and so actually all of those things, as Russell was talking about the way that we kind of uh, live out the identity that God had for us, or when I'm, when I'm creatively working, I mean, it's only writing code, but there, there is creativity involved, um, that's still kind of echoing, um, yeah, what it is to be made in the image of God. Are there times when you're, you, you start to, to doubt that and to struggle with it, in which case what, what reminds you then of the value of the work that you do? Um, Sprung that one on you. Yes, you have. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I've... So one question that has occasionally come up is kind of, actually, to what extent should I be pursuing my career or whatever, or seeking to, should I be, I don't know, trying to get into kind of more management or a bigger company or stuff like that? Um, I think I was quite early on in my Christian walk, someone really got in the idea that actually um, the Christians inevitably work 
we're not going to be focused on work as the be-all because we, we're hopefully going to understand that actually serving in the church is important, serving in family is important. And so we're not going to be as focused on work as other folk might be. And so the, the knock-on for that is that actually as a Christian, there's a real chance you're not going to have as much money as your colleagues, partly because you're not pursuing advancement in the same way, <laughs> partly because you're giving away more of your money than someone else might do, and you're not going to be a senior. So I think having that in the back of my mind that it doesn't matter if I'm not super successful in a work sense because that's only one aspect of my life and there are other things that God has called me to as well. Yeah. And are there ways, that, how do you make decisions about how you then balance your time between those different things? Um, I think it's worth carrying at it and that's with, I know I don't always make those decisions, but I, 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 very often I'll get the balance wrong. Um, I will try and keep the balance of actually I need to start at home um, because I think kind of first off I am a, a father and husband I think actually when you get all the passages in Scripture talking about the qualifications for elders, loads of them talk about like husband of one wife and able to manage their household well and talk about how the children are. Um, I think that's not just a tick list, but that's an order of priority. So actually you can't serve the church well as an elder or in any role if you're not serving your family first. And so I try to keep that as the kind of order I go, make sure I'm doing stuff at home beforehand. Yeah, great. Thank you, Wayne. We're going to pray for you. Um, if you can cool. just get back to live stream, that's fine. Let's pray uh, for Wayne and for all of us in the light of that, and then we're going to sing. Father God, thank you uh, for Wayne. Thank you for the way in which you are uh, helping him to serve you in all those different spheres of life as husband, father, software engineer, church elder. Lord, help him uh, as he continues to find, uh, to seek the best way to, to balance the time in those responsibilities that you've given him. Give him real uh, wisdom uh, to see those things and enable him to find that identity uh, most of all in you and in all that you have done for him. And with that then, his service then towards others flow from that. Lord, we pray for each of us in the different roles that you have placed us in. Uh, Lord, please guard us from uh, thinking that we find value and significance in any of those things, from seeking to earn your approval or the approval of others. Help us to delight in the gifts that you have given us and the uh, opportunities you give us to use those gifts in all the different spheres of life. Lord, we pray that you give us wisdom as we think through these things, that you would, you would help us to think your thoughts after you and to live uh, lives that reflect the goodness of the Lord Jesus and our hope that we have of his one day return. Lord, we pray you'd help us to help one another in all of these things too, to have conversations where we discuss uh, the realities of the different uh, pressures and uh, opportunities that come to us, the way in which we prioritise the different things of life. Lord, would, would we be, as your family, uh, encouraging one another and pointing each other towards the Lord Jesus and our desire to be like him and to delight in what it is to be in him. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing our final song together, which uh, reminds us that we want to have God dominate our thinking. We're grateful to him for a new identity that we enjoy. And we want our every thought and word and deed to bring glory to him. If you're able, do, that, do stand and we'll sing together.
in every deed, whether that be the conversations that we have off of the back of what we heard, and also through clearing the chairs out of the way, ready for our Christmas family fun day uh, later on. If you're not able to do that, that's okay. That's fine. Head through and grab a cup of tea and coffee. Let's pray together as we close. Lord God, you are indeed worthy to be praised with every thought and deeds that we, uh, that we have. And we praise you because you are magnificent and majestic. You are kind and you are generous. And we are grateful to you that you choose to use us for your purposes and that you even glorify your name through us. And so we pray you would do that through weak people like us, that indeed the glory might go to you. In Jesus' name. Amen. You please take a seat.